This is when Gen X ruled the multiplex, in which I look at the films that shaped the MTV generation. Today, I'm examining Ridley Scott's incredibly influential 1982 film, Blade Runner. At the time, Scott was best known for 1979's Alien, which, along with being a rip-roaringly satisfying sci-fi slash horror film, also boasted some meticulous world-building and spectacular production design. And the same goes for Blade Runner. Blade Runner is based on the 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by the prophetic and mind-bending sci-fi author Philip K. Dick. The screenplay was written by Hampton Fancher and was rewritten during production by David Peoples. There are multiple versions of Blade Runner out there. This was a difficult film to make, and the end result was more ambiguous and more cerebral than most Hollywood blockbusters of the time, and it confused audiences during test screenings. Fearing they were saddled with an expensive bomb, the producers added an explanatory voiceover and tacked on an incongruously happy ending to the theatrical release over the objections of Ridley Scott. In 1992, a director's cut was released, which removed the voiceover and the happy ending. While much closer to Scott's original vision, the director's cut was assembled quickly on a limited budget. So in 2007, the digitally remastered final cut was released under Ridley Scott's close supervision, and it is considered by purists to be the definitive version of Blade Runner. We opened in Los Angeles in November of 2019. That was also the year in which Akira, which I discussed a couple episodes back, was set. 2019 was a big year for totally awesome cinematic dystopias from the 1980s. An opening scroll gets us up to speed. The powerful Tyrell Corporation has manufactured super powerful androids, known as replicants, to be used as slave labor in off-world colonies, i.e. colonies in outer space. The latest line of replicants, the Nexus 6 series, rose up against their human masters in a violent mutiny, and thus replicants are now illegal on Earth. The Nexus 6 replicants emulate humans in every way except for emotions, though they are capable of developing emotions over time, which makes them dangerous. As a result, the Nexus 6 replicants have been created with a built-in four-year lifespan. A special unit of police officers known as Blade Runners have orders to kill any replicant who returns to Earth. The Los Angeles skyline of 2019 is a spectacular place, with flying cars and skyscrapers that shoot flames. The production design of Blade Runner, courtesy of visual designer Sid Mead, is stunning, and the lush electronic score composed by Greek musician Van Galis matches those images perfectly. At Tyrell Corp, a waste disposal engineer named Leon Kowalski, played by Brian James, is administered a test by a psychiatrist who asks hypothetical questions designed to provoke an emotional response. Leon seems confused and defensive. He responds poorly to the questions, and then he whips out a gun and kills the psychiatrist. We see scenes of Los Angeles City streets circa 2019, the dark illuminated by bright bursts of neon. For the duration of the film, Los Angeles will be dark and rainy. This serves two purposes. Blade Runner is a neo-noir, and one of the visual hallmarks of the film noir genre is scenes that are dark and rainy. Also, and perhaps more crucially, something has gone badly wrong with the Earth in 2019. Animals have been driven to the point of extinction, and most of the people have already gone to live in those aforementioned off-world colonies. In Philip K. Dick's original book, the Earth has been made radioactive by a series of nuclear wars, though the film doesn't make that explicit. For whatever ominous reason, Los Angeles is now constantly dark and constantly rainy. A former cop named Rick Deckard grabs noodles at a food stall. Deckard is played by Harrison Ford, already famous for Star Wars, although at the time he was cast in Blade Runner, Raiders of the Lost Ark hadn't yet catapulted him into the very top tier of bankable Hollywood stars. Deckard is joined by a man named Gaff, played by Miami Vice and Battlestar Galactic star Edward James Oldness. Gaff addresses Deckard in a language called City Speak, which is a mishmash of languages, notably Hungarian, and identifies him as a former Blade Runner. Deckard accompanies Gaff in his flying car to the police station, where he meets with his former supervisor Bryant, played by M. Emmett Walsh. Bryant tells Deckard six replicants hijacked an off-world shuttle and killed the crew before landing in Los Angeles. The replicants broke into Tyrell Corp for unknown reasons, and two replicants were killed in the process. Suspecting the four remaining replicants might be posing as Tyrell workers, psych tests were conducted on all new employees, which is how Leon was detected. In addition to Super Strong Leon, the remaining three fugitive replicants are Lethal Assassin Zora, played by Joanna Cassidy, Pleasure Model Pris, who is designed to serve the sexual needs of off-world colonists and who is played by Daryl Hannah, who would rise to fame in 1984, starring opposite Tom Hanks in Splash, and the group's self-sufficient leader, Roy Batty, played by Rutger Hauer, who was already very famous in his native Netherlands, but who had just begun to dabble in Hollywood films. 
Bryant asks Deckard to eliminate the four replicants, Deckard refuses, and Gaff quietly folds an origami chicken to taunt him. Bryant tells Deckard he has no choice in the matter. Deckard visits Tyrell Corp, which is housed in a matching pair of intricate golden pyramid-shaped buildings. He meets with Dr. Eldon Tyrell, played by The Shining's Joe Turkle, and with Tyrell's beautiful and cold assistant Rachel, played by Sean Young, who would go on to appear in many films throughout the 80s, including Dune, No Way Out, and Wall Street. Tyrell is curious about the tests Blade Runners administer to weed out replicants, and he asks Deckard to administer the test to Rachel. Rachel seems to answer well at first, but her responses begin to break down over time. When Rachel leaves the room, Deckard confronts Tyrell with the truth. Rachel is a replicant, but she doesn't know it. Tyrell describes Rachel as an experiment. She's been implanted with false memories of a non-existent past in the hopes of avoiding the emotional instability that eventually causes all Nexus 6 replicants to go haywire. Deckard searches Leon's hotel room and finds a stash of photographs hidden in a drawer. In the bathtub, he finds a scale from from some kind of animal. Roy and Leon visit an eye clinic run by a geneticist named Hannibal Chu, who is played by national treasure James Hong, whose career has spanned seven decades and who is now 91 years old and still working steadily. Chu creates replicant eyes for Tyrell Corp. Roy and Leon menace him and tell him they want to meet with Eldon Tyrell. Under pressure, Chu tells them where they can find a Tyrell Corp genetic designer named J.F. Sebastian. Deckard returns to his apartment and finds Rachel waiting for him. Rachel is distraught at her growing realization that she might be a Replicant. She shows him photos of her childhood, and Deckard tells her she's been implanted with false memories. He proves this by divulging her childhood secrets to her. Chris lurks outside J.F. Sebastian's apartment and charms him into inviting her inside. Sebastian is played by William Sanderson, best known for playing Larry of Larry Daryl and Daryl fame on the 1980s sitcom New Heart. Sebastian lives in the Bradbury Building. The Bradbury Building is a real-life building in downtown Los Angeles. It gets used a great deal in films and on television shows because because it's a really cool old turn-of-the-century building, and it has never looked cooler than it does here in Blade Runner. Sebastian explains that his hobby is making toys. He introduces Pris to his various marvelous walking-talking creations, which he describes as his friends. Alone in his apartment, Deckard sits at his piano and daydreams about a unicorn. The unicorn daydream was not included in the theatrical release, but it's absolutely crucial to the endings of the director's cut and the final cut versions. Deckard uses equipment to enhance Leon's photographs and spots Zora in one of them. In a crowded market, a woman identifies the scale found in Leon's apartment as a scale from an artificial snake. It has a serial number on it that allows Deckard to track it to its creator, an Egyptian man, who informs Deckard that it was bought by a man named Taffy. Taffy, played by High Pike, owns a bar called The Snake Pit. Taffy gives Deckard the runaround, but Deckard spots Zora at the bar working as a stripper who uses an artificial snake in her act. He poses as a union representative to get into her dressing room and ask her questions. Suspicious, she attacks him and bolts. He chases her down, and as a horrified Leon watches from the sidelines, shoots her in the back and kills her. Afterward, Deckard is approached by Gaff, who takes him to see Bryant. Bryant tells him Rachel has gone rogue, so she's been added to the list of replicants Deckard needs to kill. Deckard promptly runs into an enraged Leon, who beats him back. Before Leon can kill him, Rachel pops up and shoots Leon in the head. Back at Deckard's apartment, Deckard kisses Rachel. She tries to leave, but he blocks the door, grabs her, throws her against the wall, and kisses her again. He orders her to kiss him again. She refuses at first, but he insists. Even though she's clearly scared and unhappy, they end up going to bed together. There's a lot of debate out there as to whether this is a love scene or a rape. There's a high degree of coercion, and Rachel is unhappy and unwilling at the start. While she gains some enthusiasm by the end, if you behave as Deckard does in this scene without the prior explicit consent of your partner, you cannot possibly be surprised if you end up credibly accused of rape. Even though Deckard and Rachel do ultimately fall in love, we're not meant to approve of Deckard's conduct in this scene. In interviews, Sean Young and producer Michael Dealey have both mentioned that Harrison Ford was genuinely rough and intimidating while filming, and Sean Young was genuinely frightened and in tears, and that's exactly the vibe Ridley Scott wanted for this scene. Blade Runner gives us no reason to think Deckard is a good guy. If we're under the impression he's the hero, that's probably because he's played by the guy who is also Han Solo and Indiana Jones, two of the most beloved heroes of 1980s cinema. Deckard is an anti-hero, which is very common in film noir. 
He's our protagonist, and he's not a villain, but he does do morally gray things, like pressuring an obviously reluctant Rachel into sex. Back at Sebastian's place, Sebastian tells Pris that even though he's only in his 20s, he looks prematurely aged due to a medical condition that dooms him to a shorter life, much like the replicants. Roy arrives, and Roy and Pris explain that they're looking for a cure for their biodecrepitude. They're approaching the end of their built-in four-year lifespan. Under duress, Sebastian takes Roy into Tyrell Corporation and leads him to Tyrell's private quarters. Roy confronts Tyrell about his looming mortality and asks for more life, but Tyrell claims his coding sequence can't be revised. Upon hearing this, Roy kisses Tyrell and crushes his skull with his bare hands, then heads after a terrified Sebastian. He leaves the Tyrell Corporation by himself. Upon hearing about the murders of Tyrell and Sebastian from Bryant, Deckard heads to the Bradbury building and finds Pris in Sebastian's apartment. Pris attacks Deckard, and they have a pretty acrobatic fight before he ultimately kills her. When Roy arrives, Deckard attacks him. He's outsmarted and overpowered by Roy, who beats him savagely and chases him around. Deckard climbs up to the roof to escape Roy. When Roy pursues him, Deckard tries to leap across to an adjacent roof, falls short, and ends up clinging for his life. Roy leaps across easily and pulls Deckard to safety. In a memorable speech that was apparently written by Rutger Hauer, Roy tells Deckard about all the magnificent things he's seen in his short life, all of which will be lost in time like tears in rain. Having reached the end of his shortened lifespan, Roy quietly dies. Gaff shows up to congratulate Deckard on a job well done. As he's walking off, Gaff tells Deckard it's too bad Rachel won't live much longer, being a replicant. Deckard returns to his apartment and finds Rachel asleep in his bed. He he wakes her with a kiss, and she confirms that she loves and trusts him. The original theatrical release ended with Rachel and Deckard escaping Los Angeles and driving off to safety in an idyllic green paradise, which consists of B-roll footage shot for Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, while a voiceover from Deckard informs viewers that, very fortunately, Rachel was designed to live longer than four years. The director's cut and the final cut skip that closing moment of optimism and end with Deckard finding a piece of origami folded into the shape of a unicorn, presumably left there by Gaff. This is a huge difference because it suggests that Gaff knows about Deckard's unicorn daydream from earlier, which suggests that Deckard's memories are implanted, which suggests that Deckard is a replicant. It's still ambiguous, though Ridley Scott has been clear in interviews that he intends for viewers to think Deckard is a replicant. The original screenwriter, Hampton Fancher, does not believe that Deckard was a replicant, and Deckard was a human in Philip K. Dick's book. But it seems like the director should have the final say on the subject, so it's safe to conclude that Deckard is a replicant who, like Rachel, has been implanted with false memories. This is a better and more interesting ending than the theatrical release's improbably happy ending, where Rachel and Deckard simply move away from the dark rainy city to somewhere green and sunny. Terry Gilliam's Brazil from 1984, which I looked at several months ago, bears a lot of thematic and stylistic similarities to Blade Runner. For instance, they're both set in a ruined future. Like Blade Runner, the theatrical theatrical release of Brazil was plagued by studio interference. Studio executives wanted to tack on an improbably happy ending to Brazil, where the hero and his love interest escape their unrelentingly bleak lives by simply heading off somewhere green. You have to admire the confidence of studio executives in the 80s who thought they could improve these dense, complicated films set in hopeless dystopias by tacking on an ending where the hero says, yeah, screw it, and wanders off to live somewhere prettier. Blade Runner is an examination of what it means to be human and what it means to have a soul. We take it for granted at the beginning that the replicants aren't human. They were made in a lab, and the Blade Runners don't kill them. In the vernacular of the film, they retire them. They do not live, ergo they cannot die. With the introduction to Rachel, though, our perspective begins to shift. Rachel fully believes she's human, and she has a full set of human memories. And when you combine that with how she looks, thinks, behaves, and feels exactly like a human, does it really matter that she was made in a laboratory? And once you've opened your mind to the possibility that Rachel is human, it's not too far of a leap to conclude that Roy, Leon, Pris, and Zora, who care for each other and who desperately want to live beyond their allotted four years, are no less human than the Blade Runners who hunt them. It's a cool thing to think about, with no obvious answers, and Blade Runner provides plenty of opportunities to spark these kinds of conversations. Blade Runner was a critical and commercial failure upon release. It gained cult cachet on videotape and has become much loved in retrospect. I remember standing in a line that stretched for blocks and blocks to get into a screening of the director's cut at the New Art Theatre in Los Angeles in 1991. In 2017, director Denis Villeneuve released a sequel, Blade Runner 2049, which starred Harrison Ford as Deckard and continued the saga of Blade Runners and replicants in a futuristic Los Angeles. 
Blade Runner is adored, and it should be. Not only does it feature some pretty sophisticated themes, but it is visually dazzling. Ridley Scott was very clear that the future depicted in Blade Runner should not look anything like the future shown in classic sci-fi films like 2001 A Space Odyssey and Logan's Run, where everything is very new and white and uncluttered. Inspired by the neon skyline of Hong Kong, Blade Runner's Los Angeles looks like the past and the future at the same time. It's a jumbled ruin of a city. The original buildings, like the Bradbury Building, haven't been torn down, but they've been significantly altered over the years, retrofitted to add new layers, and the end result is both chaotic and cool. Thanks to Blade Runner, when most of us picture the future, we think of something closer to this dark, rainy, crowded, cluttered, neon-lit Los Angeles than the bright, white, clean corridors of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Blade Runner is the most famous example of the film subgenre of tech noir. Tech noir combines the conventions of film noir, dark rainy streets, femme fatales, nihilistic anti-heroes, widespread corruption, and places them within a framework that's futuristic or fantastical. Without Blade Runner, we might not have Dark City, or Brazil, or Strange Days, or Gattaca, or Twelve Monkeys. Blade Runner wasn't the first sci-fi-infused neo-noir. That distinction might go to Jean-Luc Godard's Alphaville from 1965. But Blade Runner brought that subgenre front and center into the Gen X consciousness by making the future look really, really cool. Similarly, Blade Runner wasn't the first sci-fi film to ponder questions of whether machines can have souls. But again, it handled that question so well that now anytime we're faced with robots or androids or AIs, whether that's in TV shows like Westworld, Battlestar Galactica, or Humans, or in films like Ex Machina, Her, and AI Artificial Intelligence, comparisons to Blade Runner are going to pop up. For a film that fizzled in theaters, Blade Runner has reached iconic status in the four decades since its release. Next time, we are going to look at the solo directorial debut of future Oscar winner Catherine Bigelow with the 1987 Western vampire thriller Near Dark. Thank you for joining me. I will see you then.